Yeah, so thank you again, Sergey, for that introduction. That was very kind. And thank you both for inviting me. I am really honored to speak in this series. This is a very cool, interesting, insightful, thought-provoking group of talks. And, and yeah, I am I'm honored. Um, so today I'm going to talk, the title of the talk is Human Social Organization During the Late Pleistocene Beyond the Nomadic Egalitarian Model. This talk is a presentation of a paper, a preprint that I co-authored with Luke Lowacki. This is a link to the preprint. I realize that you can't click it, but if you are interested, I would be happy to send it along after the talk or post it in the chat, or you can find it on my website. The world we know is, in an evolutionary sense, very recent. To really appreciate that, I have drawn a timeline here, the leftmost point being the last common ancestor with chimpanzees, very coarsely timed to six million years ago, the rightmost point being now. According to that timeline, the Neolithic Revolution, the origins of agriculture as we know them, uh, is here. If we redraw this line so that it begins with the origin of our genus, Homo, the Neolithic revolution ends up being right there. If we start with the history of our species, still the Neolithic, the Neolithic revolution is very recent. Now, many of the questions we're interested in, many of the questions at the center of this speaker series, what are the evolutionary origins of human behavior? How has society culturally evolved? What is peculiar about modernity? Many of these questions require reconstructing this pre-Neolithic time, knowing what human society looked like before the Holocene. The most popular model of pre-Neolithic lifeways is what Luke and I call the nomadic egalitarian model. This model is based mostly on observations of recent foragers, especially small scale mobile African groups like the Kalahari Kung pictured here. According to the nomadic egalitarian model for hundreds of thousands of years before the Holocene and possibly much earlier, human societies exhibited several important features. First, people lived in small bands numbering in the dozens of individuals. Most people were kin, so any single individual was likely related to most fellow band members, either through blood or marriage. These bands were then said to be nested within ethno-linguistic groups. These could number in the hundreds or the few thousands of individuals, although there's no political consolidation on that, on that ethno-linguistic level. Second, these groups were mobile, presumably. People stored very little. They had few material possessions, and as a result, notions of property were weak. These bands were also egalitarian, at least among individuals of similar age and sex. Uh, egalitarian relationships were maintained both by minimal differences in wealth and by leveling mechanisms, by teasing, gossip, threats of collective violence. Cooperation was small scale, mostly among fellow band members, so at most in you know, a couple dozen individuals. Um, and agriculture in the form of plant cultivation and animal management was absent. Most people here are probably familiar with just how widespread this nomadic egalitarian model is among social scientists and non-academics more broadly, um, but I wanted to highlight how it is not only invoked but often taken for granted among evolutionary anthropologists as well. For instance, this is a quote from Richard Lee's 2018 paper in Annual Review of Anthropology, and he writes, historically nomadic foragers, HNFs, um, small in scale, mobile, egalitarian, reflect most closely the characteristics of ancient foragers. Similarly, this is from a chapter published by Douglas Fry just a couple of months ago. He says, until just a couple of millennia before the agricultural revolution, about 10,000 years ago, humankind practiced a mobile forager life way. There is widespread agreement that this um, banned social organization was largely egalitarian. Um, it's because of this widespread assumption that when evolutionary anthropologists want to make inferences about behavior during our evolutionary history, they examine foragers that embody the nomadic egalitarian model. There are many examples, but this is one from my co-author, Luke Lowacki, on the evolutionary origins of warfare. So with Richard Wrangham, uh, he was comparing intergroup aggression in chimpanzees and war in nomadic hunter-gatherers to inform the evolution of intergroup conflict. I choose Luke here just because I want to highlight that he and I have subscribed just as much as anyone to the nomadic egalitarian model. I'm not trying to like pick on people here. 
The nomadic egalitarian model has two major implications, both, both of which I've briefly gestured at. First, it shapes how we think about the evolution of human behavior. So let's just consider egalitarianism as an example. That's just one facet of the nomadic egalitarian model. Chris Bohm in his book, Moral Origins and in many other publications has invoked the supposed egalitarianism of our prehistory to explain the evolution of a broad spectrum of social behaviors, including morality, cooperative dispositions, social emotions. Similarly, uh, both Kaplan and colleagues and Whiten and colleagues have argued that egalitarianism is a core feature of human social evolution, that we cannot explain human social organization, human subsistence strategies, or social cognition without considering egalitarianism. This is a figure from White uh, Whiten and All's 20, 2012 paper, and you can see that egalitarianism is presumably this key component of human social and cognitive adaptation, really linked deeply to culture, to cooperation, to mind reading, to language, that it's a part of this, this uh, social and cognitive adaptive complex. So that is just one implication of the nomadic egalitarian model. The second is that the model casts a whole suite of ubiquitous behaviors and features of social organization as historically novel and therefore in need of special explanation. This is a long list, but it should just give you a sense of some of the major behaviors that are sometimes said to be historically novel as a, as a result, I think in major part um, of the nomadic egalitarian model, social stratification, inherited inequality, hereditary inequality, corporate groups, so uh, clans, moieties, uh, corporate lineages, other corporate lineages, territoriality, property, at least property over land, large-scale cooperation, so cooperative projects involving hundreds of individuals, and of course thousands of individuals, large-scale political consolidation, plant management, cultivation, and the, the management of animal populations. Now, it is not the case that everyone who subscribes to some form of the nomadic egalitarian model posits that every feature on this list is evolutionary novel, evolutionarily novel. These are just some important and common examples. Now, there is longstanding dissatisfaction with features of the nomadic egalitarian model, especially among Evolutionary, evolutionary anthropologists. This is a great paper. I think it's either in Science or Nature that summarizes it in 1988. Um, but it appears that recently this dissatisfaction is growing. In the remainder of this talk, I'm going to synthesize this literature, this, this growing dissatisfaction and other literature. Um, first, to argue that the nomadic egalitarian model is flawed. Second, to propose an alternative and finally, and very briefly to explore some of the implications. Um, I'm really just going to gesture at implications and invite all of you to discuss them more in the Q&A. The alternative I will describe is what we call the diverse histories model. So according to the nomadic egalitarian model, late Pleistocenes were, late Pleistocene societies were mobile. They had minimal food storage. Um, depending on some formulations, they subsisted on terrestrial resources. Um, they were relatively egalitarian. Status competition was minimized, small groups, small cooperation, much of what we discussed. Um, the diverse histories model, in contrast, argues that late Pleistocene societies were much more diverse. Some societies exhibited the features of the nomadic egalitarian model, but others were sedentary or semi-sedentary. Semi they may have stored food, had subsisted on aquatic resources, been hierarchical in whichever form, rather than minimizing status competition, actually institutionalizing it. They may have had large groups on the scales, possibly of thousands we'll discuss, large scale cooperation. This plot compares uh, the claims of the nomadic egalitarian model and the diverse histories model um, of forager social diversity throughout history. So the x-axis is time. This is now, here's 100 years ago. Here is uh, maybe 200,000 years ago, 180,000 years ago. This is logarithmic, so it's 100, 1,000, 10,000. So around here is the, the Holocene, the start of the Holocene. Both the nomadic egalitarian model 
and the diverse histories model, you'll see, agree that forager social diversity declined throughout much of the Holocene with the spread of agriculturalists. Um, but whereas the nomadic egalitarian model posits mostly small scale uh, mobile egalitarian groups before the Holocene, the diverse history model uh, posits much more diverse social organization. Moving forward, I want to point out three points that challenge the nomadic egalitarian model and which indicate greater diversity during the late Pleistocene. So we're going to talk about the limitations of relying on recent mobile foragers as models of pre-Neolithic life ways. We're going to think about the ways in which the nomadic egalitarian model in fact mischaracterizes many recent foragers, many foragers that are supposedly small scale mobile and uh, relatively egalitarian. And then finally, we're going to consider the importance of low mobility of sedentary and non-egalitarian foragers, often called complex hunter-gatherers, for our reconstructions of the late Pleistocene. So let's start with this first one. Let's start with limitations of relying on recent mobile foragers. So this first limitation that I'm going to discuss, uh, the first limitation of relying on recent foragers is what some anthropologists call the marginalized habitat hypothesis. The idea being that modern hunter-gatherers have been relegated to low quality habitats, deserts, the Arctic, and so on, by agriculturalists. As a result, the idea goes, most recent foragers are representative only of those hunter-gatherers living in harsh environments. Now, there have been, in fact, two tests of this hypothesis, one by Porter and Marlowe in 2007, the other by um, Cunningham et al. in 2019, both compared habitat quality between recent hunter-gatherers and agriculturalists and actually found no difference to the surprise of many. Um, but there are two complications with these kinds of analyses and both are actually summarized very nicely by, by Cunningham et al. So the first is that these comparisons were restricted to non-industrialized societies. They used the standard cross-cultural sample, which is only non-industrialized societies at the time the data is coded. So these are not actually comparisons of foragers with agriculturalists, but of foragers with that subset of agricultural and pastoral people who did not live in industrial societies when the data was compiled. People like the Maasai um, and the Nenets of the Russian far north. This means that these analyses exclude the incredibly productive environments where people have built cities and large states, places like the Nile and like the Western Cape of South Africa. The second complication I wanna point out is that these analyses previously used net primary productivity. This is a potentially misleading proxy Although it captures the productivity of an environment, it doesn't actually capture how much of that productivity is available to humans. And I think there are two nice examples that demonstrate this. The first are rainforests. So rainforests have very high NPP, very high primary productivity. And so in their analysis, people like the Mbuti, the Siriono are said to live in very rich habitats. Um, but much of that uh, productivity, as anthropologists have pointed out, is stored in non-edible woody tissue. And even edible items are often costly to acquire and process. Maybe they're poisonous, maybe they're high up in the canopy. canopy. In fact, some anthropologists have even gone so far as to argue that foragers could not live independently in rainforests, that a forager couldn't live there without engaging in trade with, with nearby, nearby uh, agricultural groups. The other example is the Hadza case, and this was actually pointed out to us by Brian Wood, a Hadza anthropologist, or an anthropologist who works with the Hadza, after we released our preprint. And Brian has data, very cool data, hopefully it will appear in publications soon, showing that the Hadza environment appears to be impoverished of wild game, um, partly potentially because of all the livestock that are, that are flowing in. So by some standards, it is a lower quality environment, but net primary productivity doesn't capture this. That's quite a bit into the marginalized hypothesis or marginalized habitat hypothesis. I've gone into so much detail because this is one of the major limitations that's often brought up in these two studies are often presented as, as counter to it. Nevertheless, regardless of these complications, and if we want to be most conservative, we can at least say that many canonical models, such as the, the Kung of the Kalahari, live in marginal habitats and that ancestral hunter-gatherers inhabited many habitats that modern hunter-gatherers do not. And this is something we're gonna look at in much greater depth later, 
but we'll see that the rich aquatic environments that are occupied by industrialized states today once held uh, sedentary and non-egalitarian, these so-called complex hunter-gatherers all over the world. So agriculturists, agriculturalists have impacted modern hunter-gatherers beyond pushing them to these marginal habitats. They've incorporated them, pacified them into their spheres of control. They've traded with them, they've employed them, they've even enslaved them. And some of these interactions have deep, deep histories. This is most clearly illustrated by the fact that many hunter-gatherers, such as in the Philippines, such as in Central Africa, speak languages closely related to farmers. Um, on the basis of genetic and linguistic analyses, researchers have shown that these relationships go back thousands of years. Um, and this is often tied to this claim that hunter-gatherers may not be able to live alone in rainforests, given that the ones that we see living in rainforests have actually interacted in, in such great depths. To think about these interactions with agriculturalists, I want to consider the Kung. Um, the Kung are often considered stand-ins for Paleolithic peoples, not necessarily by those who study them, but by many other researchers. Yet, as the debates of the late 1980s and the early 1990s have shown, the Kung have had deep and important interactions with agriculturalists. Like I've written here, they began trading with Bantu farmers somewhere between 500 and 1500 years ago. And in the 1920s, Bantu agro-pastoralists entered the Dobe area so that by the time the Harvard Kalahari project, arguably this very important project in documenting Kung lifeways, by the time that started in 1963, the Kung were already incorporated into what uh, Solway and Lee called this regional pastoral tributary and mercantile economy. And just to really appreciate what that looks like during the early years of the Harvard Kalahari project, this, this area, the Dobe area, contained 466 Dobe Kung across nine camps. That same area included 340 Bantu pastoralists, thousands of cattle. In eight of the nine camps in the region, the Bantu and the Kung actually lived together. And you can, so you can see this in, in Lee's book. He very clearly talks about how many Bantu are living in these camps, how many Kung are living in the camps. And at a given, any given time, 20% of Kung were working with cattle. Although Lee didn't see any cultivation when he first arrived in 1963, 1964, during the 1967 to 69 field season, he found that half of Kung men were planting fields. Interactions such as these have had really important effects on social organization, a major example being authority. So for most people, the Kung are an exemplar of hyper-egalitarianism. Lee called them this fiercely egalitarian people. There's this long quote, um, but Lee writes that egalitarianism among the Kung is not just that they don't have a headman or other authority figures, but it is this insistence on the essential equality of all people, um, a sentiment expressed in the statement, of course we have headmen, have head, head each one of us is headman over himself. Uh, yet, as Polly Wiesner has pointed out, and as indicated by earlier ethnographers, the Kung appear to have experienced a decline in leadership following this Bantu incursion. Uh, it appears that before the Bantu came in and displaced these local leaders, the Kung had leadership institutions that were hereditary, that were restricted to men, um, and where these headmen were considered the owners of water, water holes and presumably could deny access to outsiders. These interactions with agriculturalists also appear to affect mobility patterns. So for one, pacification or incorporation reduces the need to live in large sedentary groups. If there's no more warfare, you no longer need to be in these large villages. And Paul Roscoe has found in his analyses of New Guinea or his examinations of, of New Guinea history um, that following the colonial presence from the mid 20th century onwards, these large villages of coastal foragers often splintered into these much smaller and more mobile groups. Um, some groups also appear to become mobile foragers to specialize in trade. So the Penan of Borneo, who were long considered, I, I read somewhere they were considered a primitive forager group, um, but their forager lifestyle, their mobile small scale lifestyle was in fact a strategy for collecting items considered valuable to Chinese traders like bird's nests, rattan, beeswax. Finally, mobility can be a strategy for escaping state control. James Scott has famously written about this both in contemporary Southeast Asia and 
the early states in the Levant. It's also been observed among many pastoralist groups. So that those are the limitations of relying on recent mobile hunter-gatherers. Even so, uh, now I want to move on to how the nomadic egalitarian model often mischaracterizes presumably mobile and, and um, egalitarian foragers. I want to start with group size and mobility. So many studies have found that recent mobile hunter-gatherers lived in groups of a few dozen individuals, often around 25 or a similar order of magnitude, leading to this very reasonable conclusion that late Pleistocene peoples lived in similarly small-scale groups. Now, reviewing these studies, Kelly, in his beautiful survey of hunter-gatherer diversity, referred to 25 as one of the magical numbers of mobile hunter-gatherer social organization. But this focus on mean or median population size hides two important dimensions of variation. The first is within society. In his survey of Mbuti peoples, for instance, Turnbull distinguished among the Efe, who he called the archers, and the Swa Mbuti, Mbuti, who he called the net hunters. The archers had a mean of 36 individuals per camp, although that ranged from, seven, from 12 to over 70, uh, while the net hunters had villages sometimes of over 200 people. Similarly, the, the Kung living in the Dobe region had camp sizes varying from nine individuals um, in 1964 to more than 100. And again, I'm talking about groups on the scale of hundreds when we look at some of these sedentary or low mobility foragers, we'll see groups on orders of magnitude larger than that. A second important dimension is temporal. And this is a point that David Wengro, David Wengro and the late David Graeber have recently made. For instance, many presumably mobile small scale foragers actually seasonally transitioned between small mobile groups and large sedentary settlements. Um, some peoples shifted between summer and winter organizations, as in Arctic and Alaskan populations. Others shifted between dry and wet season uh, habit, uh, organization structures, like in Northern Australia. Here, we can see the population sizes of 76 Yupik winter villages. And you can see that um, they're much larger than 25. Several exceed 200. Some are even as large as, some are larger than 300 individuals. This was published in um, Mouse's analysis of seasonal variation. I think this data is from like the 1880s or the 1890s. So I just covered how so-called small-scale mobile foragers varied considerably in group size and mobility patterns, but they also demonstrated much more variation in other behaviors as well. I know that Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson, um, one of our co-hosts, uh, have collected and will hopefully publish soon many incredible examples of mobile foragers in North America, Australia, Europe, and the Arctic, most in the Holocene, but some potentially in the late Pleistocene, engaging in large-scale cooperation with hundreds of individuals in domains like hunting, warfare, the construction of shared facilities. There are other examples of so-called mobile and egalitarian foragers exhibiting much more social diversity than is often appreciated. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into these in great depth right now, but I'm glad to discuss them afterwards. One example is authority. Contrary to a popular belief, many mobile small-scale foragers, in fact, have quite coercive leadership. There's quite a bit of research on this, especially on African or uh, Australian forager groups. but. One recent example is this paper published by Garfield, Zach Garfield and colleagues in 2012 or 2020 in Evolution and Human Behavior. Um, they looked across cultures and reported that although coercive leadership is admittedly less common among foragers, it is present nevertheless. And relatedly, they found that shamans, these magical religious practitioners, actually often leverage their supposed powers to exercise political authority. A final example that I quickly want to touch on is resource management. Again, I'm glad to talk about this later, um, but the example that I've just posted here is one that I've been a, a bit obsessed with this year, um, which is couscous management in New Guinea. So these couscouses are furby, furby-like, furry, cat-like marsupials. They live in New Guinea and the surrounding islands. They go as far as Sulawesi. Um, and then into the South Pacific. And on the basis of archeological findings, we now know that hunter-gatherers appear to have been managing couscous populations uh, po potentially as far back as 20,000 years ago. 
again, there are many examples of resource management um, that I think are very striking, and I'd be glad to dig into those later during the Q&A if people are interested. Finally, let's consider the relevance of these so-called complex hunter-gatherers, what I'll consider here to be sedentary and non-egalitarian foragers. To this point, I've focused on what anthropologists often call mobile hunter-gatherers, who, according to some anthropological wisdom, tend to exhibit traits like these. They subsist on terrestrial resources, food storage is rare, they're mobile, they're relatively egalitarian, at least among individuals of the same age and sex, slavery is absent, status competition is minimized. Um, but anthropologists, such as Kelly here, often contrast these mobile foragers with what we might call sedentary or what some people like to call complex hunter-gatherers. According to anthropological wisdom, these foragers subsisted on aquatic resources, they more often had food storage, they were low mobility, they may have had wealth hierarchies or hereditary hierarchies, slavery was present, competition, status competition was publicized or institutionalized. You should treat this, this um, bipartite schema as a heuristic typology there are low mobility foragers who do not, for instance, um, there are sedentary low mobility foragers who do not, for instance, exploit aquatic resources as we'll see, or have slaves. It's also unclear whether it makes sense to treat these as two categories or as a dimension that captures most of the variation or if it's multidimensional. Again, I just want people to treat this as a convenient typological heuristic. This relationship between aquatic and more generally rich, dense resources and sedentism and hierarchy seems to follow from a dynamic like this. So people exploit rich, defensible, predictable resources that in, turns allow the, that in turn allows them to be dense. It allows them to have lower mobility. It allows them to stochastically, uh, some individuals can accumulate more than others and they can then exercise those in forms of equality, inequality or hierarchy, or they can distribute them for status. There was a very cool paper that came out last week uh, that examined, or that tested this hypothesis, whether rich defensible resources produce so-called com complex foragers uh, by examining Californian foragers, just in PNAS, very relevant and recent project. Um, What's critical seems to be this capacity to accumulate resources, to at least control resources. As Testart wrote, only those who have at their disposal and excess can be considered rich, can be classified as rich. So you need stuff to be rich. As we'll see, there appear to be many examples of low mobility foragers documented both ethnographically and archeologically around the world. Perhaps the most well-known are the indigenous people of the Pacific Northwest, people like the Tlingit, like the Haida. Uh, right now though, I'm gonna tell you about a group that, that is often overlooked, the low mobility sedentary foragers of coastal New Guinea, so here. New Guinea's hunter-gatherers vary tremendously, although all of them seem to share the subsistence strategy of subsisting on starch from the sago palm, from wild sago palm. According to Paul Roscoe, who has conducted fieldwork in New Guinea and really engaged with the historical literature, we can divide all of these New Guinean foragers into two categories, ignoring those who engage in trade. First are those who subsist on terrestrial and arboreal game. These people's according to him, resemble mobile foragers elsewhere. So they have small bands, they're relatively, or they're mobile, they have low population density, they're relatively egalitarian. And an example are the, the people pictured here on the right, the Mayakumbut, I may mispronounce names. I've tried typically to, to learn how to, but I just wanna say I might mispronounce words at times. Um, so Roscoe contrasts these terrestrial and arboreal foragers with another set, uh, those who subsist on aquatic resources, like the asthmat pictured here. These foragers, Roscoe writes, exhibited a cultural complexity that rivaled or surpassed that of many intensive agriculturalists. So let's take a deeper look at the asthmat just to really appreciate what's going on. The Asmat live in southwest New Guinea on the Indonesian side in what is now West Papua. Uh, there are more than 70,000 Asmat and they are split into various subgroups. 
a single ASMAT village can have anywhere from a couple hundred to more than a thousand people. I think one of these authors, uh, Noft or Roscoe, also mentioned other coastal New Guinean foragers with villages exceeding 2,000 people. So the ASMAT had, and they still have chiefs. These were polygynous, some of them highly so. Through marriage, they would acquire sago stands and fishing grounds. And then through distributions of those resources, they would achieve high status. The Asmat are also known for their elaborate artistic culture. These are just some examples that pop up when you search them on Google. You'll see that they are in collections like the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. An incredible example of both the surplus of the ASMAT and their acceptance of hierarchy is the erection of what is called the bispole. So the, the bispole erection occurred after a leader or a group of leaders commissioned the construction of this really elaborately carved ancestor pole. They paid carvers to make it who, as I understand, spent something like three months making the pole now that kind of surplus, that kind of artistic division of labor is impossible under the nomadic egalitarian model for specialists to spend three months uh, paid by, by some individual. Upon completion, they would erect the pole before the men's house in the ceremonial inauguration with a feast that could include up to 2000 people. I realize you can't click this, maybe I'll uh, post it after the talk. Um, this is a video of what I understand to be the Bispol erection. For the sake of time, I'm not going to show it. Again, I'll potentially post a link afterwards. But I'll just say that the video includes indications of these large groups, this acceptance of inequality, or at least status hierarchies, and elaborateness of material culture. I do want to say that um, if you follow up and check out this video, I don't know the context. Perhaps it was staged. That's always something that one should be careful of. And by staged, I mean, you know, some TV crew from Italy, for instance, came and paid everyone to not wear clothes. Yeah, I mentioned that example in particular, an Italian TV crew coming and paying people not to wear clothes because that has happened where I do field work. Um, so sedentary and non-egalitarian foragers like the Asmat, like the Tlingit, and the Haida really seem to have been overlooked, especially in our reconstructions of the late Pleistocene. Um, so when Jean Arnold and her colleagues examined biological anthropology textbooks published between 2006 and 2014, she reportedly found no mention of these low mobility foragers. Chris Bohm deliberately excluded them from his otherwise excellent hunter-gatherer database, this database of what he calls late Pleistocene appropriate foragers. Marlowe, Frank Marlowe in 2005, in his review of hunter-gatherers and human evolution, wrote that these sedentary foragers may not or may have been present immediately before the Holocene, but for modeling earlier periods, we should exclude them. It seems that for historical reasons, there are at least three reasons people have this impulse to exclude sedentary or non-egalitarian foragers from reconstructions of late Pleistocene societies. First, they appear to be anomalous, rare, they're exceptional, is the idea. Uh, second, there is this belief that they exploit aquatic resources, a behavior that was long assumed to have developed late in human history. And finally, there is this idea that there is little archaeological evidence for them in the late Pleistocene. So let's dig into all, of th all three of these. Note, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to leave a lot out. So I'm glad to revisit any of these topics in greater detail in the Q&A. First, are they anomalous? The answer seems to be no. This is a map showing 34 regions um, that supported sedentary and non-egalitarian foragers throughout the Holocene, and in some cases, the Epipaleolithic or the upi Upper Paleolithic. This is not a systematic or exhaustive list. People might notice that I have left out Peru. I have left out much of California. I have left out the Chilmoon. Um, dots in blue are archeological examples. Those in red are ethnographically documented examples. Purple indicates both. You'll see that most, many of these groups were exploiting aquatic resources, often on the coasts and often in places that today host major cities, places like the South African Cape, the Nile, Southern Scandinavia, Japan, um, Montevideo and Buenos Aires, Bangkok, and so on. 
Now, importantly, this includes sites where researchers have reported evidence of low mobility hunter-gatherers. Some, but not all, have indications of inequality or large group size. Um, many of these are archaeological and there's just an absence of evidence, so there's no indication either way, but I want to be clear that not all of these, for not all of these is there evidence of inequality in whatever form or large group size. These are all of the African sites that we included. I want you to note two things. First, that there's evidence of low mobility foragers in different parts of Africa very soon after the Holocene starts. Um, so if you would see 10,000 years before present, 9.5 thousand years before present. Um, so it would be reasonable, I think, that they would be there immediately before. Also, you should note that many of these groups subsisted on rich, dense aquatic resources, but some did not. So this site, site eight, um, people here were exploiting Barbary sheep and nuts and land snails. This was an arid semi-desert. Well then, what about aquatic resources? For much of the 20th century, there was an assumption that humans did not exploit aquatic resources until recently, somewhere between 40,000 and 7,000 years ago. We now know that this is wrong. This is a quote from Curtis Marion from 2014. Uh, sites on, South, on the South African coast as early as 100,000, 110,000 years ago. And now I, would, I think he would say maybe like 125. I don't want to quote him directly, but I think this has been pushed back. Have features consistent with a coastal adaptation as it is widely defined in the coastal hunter-gatherer literature. Um, so people appeared not only to exploit aquatic resources, but they did so so intensively that for Marion, at least, they would qualify as coastal hunter-gatherers. Still, we should appreciate that low mobility and non-egalitarian foragers emerged in places with dense, reliable, rich resources that were not coastal. Anadromous fish, bowhead whales, large Pleistocene megafauna, so for instance, mammoths, camelids, gazelles, hazelnuts, acorns. On top of all that, this is another figure from the paper in which we show sites in Middle Stone Age Africa. So this ranges from like 130,000 to around 40,000 years ago, where people exploited the kinds of dense, predictable aquatic resources that reliably give rise to low, mobile, and sometimes non-egalitarian societies. So these black circles are coastal sites, white are riverine, uh, red are also coastal, but these are special. These are shell middens. They are sites where people exploited shellfish so reliably and so intensively that they created these heaps composed only of shells. These are what Marion discussed as these sites of coastal adaptation. So appreciating this, examining this naturally takes us to this third question when it comes to thinking about sedentary non-egalitarian foragers in the late Pleistocene, which is, is there evidence? Is there evidence in the late Pleistocene? Aside from the, the exploitation evidence we just saw. Well, there are sites like these, sites like these, uh, sites of elaborate burials, sites like Sungir in Russia, Arunakandida in Italy, Dolnevis de Nietzsche in the Czech Republic. These are sites where individuals were buried with elaborate grave goods. These are admittedly often hard to interpret, but they at least suggest investment in highly costly, highly ornamental items and potentially also the time to construct them. There's also Gebekli Tepe, this puzzling megalithic site built by Neolithic hunter-gatherers. There are also Epipaleolithic necropolises and cemeteries. Uh, necropolises or cemeteries where people buried their dead and which seem to indicate density and or sedentism. Uh, although striking, of course, although interesting, all of this evidence is just from 40,000 years ago or younger, and it's all in the circa Mediterranean or, or Eurasia, Western Eurasia. So it raises this very basic question, this very important question of what about Africa? We admittedly saw evidence of this intensive exploitation of coastal, coastal resources, which I think is important, but where are, the, where are the megalithic structures? Where are the cemeteries? Where are the elaborate grave goods? Now, there are two constraints that have really limited the opportunity to discover the indications I just listed of sedentary hierarchical complex large-scale hunter-gatherers in late Pleistocene Africa. The first is very simple, far fewer 
archaeologists work in Africa. And to appreciate this, I want people to think of the Calusa. Um, I haven't described the Calusa in this talk, but the Calusa were an incredible demonstration of complexity among a non-agricultural people. They were, again, in Florida. They built a state, essentially, that collected tribute from vassal polities. They were composed of 50 to 60 politically consolidated villages. All of those villages were under the rule purportedly of a single king who ruled from an island that had a canal built down the middle. And yet, despite all of that, despite early Spanish reports of the Calusa, despite them being in urban Florida, my mother-in-law has a farm on Calusa land. They were largely unknown to archeologists until about the 1970s. So now imagine something much farther from the centers of archeology span and something that is not 500 years old, but 100,000 years old. The opportunity for discovery, I think is much smaller. The second important consideration is that most promising sites are submerged. This is another figure from the paper. The line is um, at sea level and it goes over the last 260,000 years. Here's now, here's 260,000 years ago. Here's the Holocene. You'll see that very rarely over the last 260,000 years has sea level been at or above its current levels. So it's mostly much lower. So the main line is um, sea level and then it's surrounded by a confidence interval. So yes, very rarely in the last 200,000 years has it been at or above this, this current level. Um, that means not only that much evidence has been potentially submerged, evidence again, in this very ideal spot, that of the coasts, um, but that with rising and falling sea levels, there have been many opportunities to destroy this very promising evidence, this coastal evidence. I've also included these four sites that have evidence of shell middens, if you remember our brief mention of shell middens. These are, again, these indirect indications of an intensive coast, or they're indications of an intensive coastal adaptation. They're indirect uh, indications of um, low mobility, non-egalitarian foragers. And you can see that our best indications of those kinds of lifestyles are from when sea levels were the highest, when they're closest to now. And, and in fact, some of these sites like Pinnacle Point have been selected precisely because they were really serendipi serendipitously situated so as to have escaped these fluctuating seas. To summarize then everything that we've just talked about, um, the background image to people who don't know is an illustration of the Calusa, the people of Florida that I just referred to. But yeah, so to summarize, many foragers, many recent foragers were shaped by their interactions with agricultural societies. The social organization of what we often think of as mobile and egalitarian groups was much more diverse than is often appreciated. Humans subsisting on rich predictable resources reliably build societies throughout the Holocene that are low mobility and throughout the Holocene into the Epipaleolithic and Upper Paleolithic Europe, it appears, built societies that were low mobility and often non-egalitarian and large. And so insofar as we think that humans have been behaviorally modern for 100,000, 200,000 years, we should expect that they were likely socially diverse for that period as well. Insofar as we are analogous or roughly similar to these, these humans 100,000 years ago, they should have had the same capacity to build these societies. Now, let's, before we conclude, this screen is, just imagine that it's a landscape and it's composed of 500 equally sized patches. 499 of the available patches are these white ones. So 499 patches are white. They are filled with people who live at the density of the Kung, so very, very low population density. Pardon me. And then let's imagine that the single patch is filled by coastal foragers living at the density of some New Guinean sedentary hunter-gatherers. If that is the case, then we, you know, if we count up how many humans live here and how many humans live there, a quarter of all of the humans in this landscape live in this single patch. And then three quarters live in the other patch. And I mention this to say, even if most of the landscape was filled with mobile egalitarian foragers, even a tiny proportion of sedent or even a tiny proportion of the landscape being filled by sedentary dense foragers would constitute a huge portion of human population or 
a sizable portion of human population. And this constitute a major environment in which human psychology, human behavior would need to be flexibly adapted. This brings me to a final and very quick end of the talk, the implications. Now, we have yet to really explore the implications, but Luke and I think that to start, the diverse histories model, this one that I just laid out, helps explain behaviors that I claim are difficult to explain under the nomadic egalitarian model. These include behaviors related to dominance and status seeking, um, behaviors related to group identity and minimal group affiliation. There's also, we think, a potentially expanded opportunity for gene cultural coevolution. And as a result of human psychology being adapted to these somewhat large scale societies and institutions, uh, Luke has also discussed, I forgot to post this here, implications for how we think about intergroup relations. There's this tendency to think about intergroup relationships as um, peaceful or warlike, but this is complicated if we think about there being this diverse social organization. Now, to leave time for discussion, I'm gonna end the talk here, but I would be excited to discuss this or anything else. I know that Sergey is skeptical of at least some of these implications. So maybe there's an opportunity to discuss that in the Q&A. Um, with that, I want to conclude and say once again that this was a project with Luke Lowacki pictured here. This is my field assistant, Rustam. This is us hanging out in Mentawe. We recently, again, posted this preprint, which you can find um, here if you write that down or on my website. And that is it. Yeah, thank you, everyone. If there are any questions, I would love to hear them. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, uh, Manuel. Uh, great, great talk, great illustrations. Very uh, thought-provoking thought talk. Um, you know, while people are gathering their thoughts and uh, writing their questions, um, let me let me ask you one thing right away. So you, you show the graph uh, with the sea level, which is, which indeed is very striking, right? But there is also a similar kind of uh, looking graphs for the temperature. So the story about emergence of uh, larger scale societies in the last 10,000 years make kind of sense because of the dramatic uh, climate change that happened. So uh, if uh, indeed uh, these larger societies were present much earlier, why didn't they spread around? Why didn't they uh, establish civilizations? I mean, why didn't they leave more archaeological evidence? Uh, so I guess, yeah, it's a question about the climate and its effects. So just to come to the climate, um, uh, so I, just to clarify, is the implication that because both there is stability of climate and because climate is warmer, we would expect, or it makes sense that you have um, these kinds of so social changes here, but not previously. Is that what you're saying? Because of bo yeah. both it being being like habitable and stable. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, something that I am really trying to figure out right now is essentially how long do you need climatic stability to produce some of these complex non-egalitarian low mobility forager societies? Um, and. When one looks, for instance, at the archaeological evidence in the Pacific Northwest, it seems that, uh, actually, I don't want to make claims because I don't know this well enough. I will just say that, yeah, I think an, an ongoing question that we're trying to figure out is how long do you need climatic stability for you to have these changes? And were those durations of climatic stability uh, stable or did they appear throughout history. My, my quick suspicion is it doesn't take long for a climate to be stable, for you to settle down, accumulate resources, produce some, have large groups, et cetera. But it is an empirical question that I'm trying to figure out. Your other point about, um, we can also think about warmth, et cetera. So people who do paleoclimate would know this better, but my sense is that it, you know, people like Curtis Marion are arguing that the coasts are um, climatically pleasant enough or protected from these kinds of fluctuations that they would have been refugia throughout the late Pleistocene. Um, Christian Tryon has also argued that lake margins would have been stably, pretty reliably productive. Uh, 
at least at 60,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, potentially earlier. So, and again, I haven't really dug into the primary literature, but on the basis of people like them, I have at least inferred that there were enough places in Africa that were pretty warm and climatically stable to create these conditions. An interesting case study, though, is uh, Ohalo 2. Oh, yeah, which I mentioned here, Ohalo 2. Ohalo 2 is at the height of the last glacial maximum. It's at 20 something thousand, 22, I think. Um, and it was submerged. It was submerged until 1988. So it's in Israel. Um, the Israelis were lowering the lake. And then there was a drought, and the drought lowered the, the lake waters even more. You might know Ohalo too. I don't mean to preach about it. Um, but the quick mention is that this is the height of the last glacial maximum. It is evidence of uh, fisher foragers who at least are, appear to be living year round at a site who are cultivating plants. And you even, it's controversial because there even seem to be indications of domestic lake changes. Um, and so I only mentioned that that is height of the LGM. Um, and you see something as extreme as potential domestication. So that leads me to really shift my priors about the potential for people to, to build these kinds of societies in peri during periods that we would otherwise think of as harsh. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. With regards to your archaeological question, yeah, no, that's of course mm -hmm. the gap. But I, I was talking to one person recently who was like, did humans, yeah, did humans somewhere around here get into Europe and build complex societies. We actually don't know um, because I think the conditions are not, would have, I don't remember, but in talking to her, she seemed to suggest that the kinds of climatic changes that have occurred since then would have destroyed that evidence. Now that is of course a much more extreme claim than I wanna make, but I just found that kind of stirring that uh, this archeologist thought that you could find something as striking as like small civilizations at 100,000 years ago, just based on the biases of the archeological record. Okay, hey, thanks. Uh, there is kind of a related question, maybe you can answer it quickly. Um, considering Northwestern course archeology, span sedentism seems to have only risen in, in few thousand of years, even with largely the same ecology since Holocene. Rich predictable resources themselves do not seem to lead to sedentism directly, at least in the case of Northwest Coast. What are your thoughts about this? So you're saying that it. Uh, well, yeah, example of Northwestern Coast. Uh, where... Right. Why was it variable? Why didn't you reliably get it everywhere? Well, uh, no, the, the question is uh, that uh, there, there are these rich predictable resources, uh, but oh, according okay. to uh, archaeology, uh, only recently uh, larger societies in uh, yeah, so like, why don't you see it until whatever, three, four, five? Well, um, yeah, it's, I, I guess, yeah, it's really kind of related to what I was asking, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, to be frank, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the archaeological archaeology or the history there. And it does, I, I mean, there are striking examples of foragers, modern foragers who live in places that seem to have dense, reliable, rich resources who are not building these kinds of societies. Many people on the call might know this better, but I sometimes, and again, I haven't really dug into this literature, but I wonder about the Tierra del Fuegans who are living in a, maybe it's too harsh, but it's a coastal environment. You would think that things would potentially be different, but again, I don't know enough about that. But I mentioned that to say, yeah, there is certainly more to the story than simply living in places with, um, Dense, predictable, rich, reliable resources. Thanks. Uh, the next one. Thanks, Manvir, for the interesting talk. My question is about the implications for evolutionary ecology of human cognition. One influential model is partner choice. The idea. Um, we jumped. The idea that uh, human social ecologists have many opportunities for win-win cooperation with non-kin, and also the persistent risk of exploitation. Uh, and this ecology selects for many important aspects of human cognition. Does your reanalysis of human evolutionary ecologies challenge uh, that model or support it? Does it challenge the model that people yeah. would have cognitive adaptations for selecting among uh, non-kin to engage par in? About partner, like partner choice. choice. Partner choice is um, at the core here. 
Right, right. Um, so I guess there are two ways of answering that. One is that in societies that have corporate groups, I guess there are three. There are three quick points. One is we're saying that uh, social ecology is socially diverse. So, insofar as the nomadic egalitarian model is used to support a partner choice model, we would concede that that kind of a social ecology would, have, you know, given that we think that it was probably an environment in which humans were engaging. Yeah. Then. Um, it would still be consistent. We're not pushing that out the door. Nevertheless, I would say that, um, and maybe others disagree on the call, but I do think that the opportunity for partner choice in societies that have corporate groups and corporate lineages is very much restricted, um, both because your cooperative partners are partly defined, but also because I think that the opportunity to use an individual's behavior towards someone as ge like generally informative, you know, you have a you have a good trait, is is much reduced. Um, that doesn't really answer the question. I would say that. Oh yeah, and the third thing I was thinking was um, one thing that we are thinking about is that people are living potentially in villages, at least sometimes, on the scale of thousands of individuals, um, and so. Under that framework, it would actually be quite consistent insofar as like the social ecology is fluid enough. Um, so the way to integrate those three responses is like, it, I would have to think more about it. Um, I do admittedly j just in general think that uh, partner choices is, is less pertinent in societies that have really defined corporate lineages. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um... The next one. Thank you, Manvir. Great, rich, rich, detailed talk. Why only contrast described the egalitarianism of many foragers to coercion, uh, prestige-based informal hierarchy built on many subtle status competition is also absent in the egalitarian ancestor model, despite documented relationships with conflict resolution, mating opportunities, uh, coordinated leadership, and our fitness-related outcomes. Yeah, I'm just going to read that question. So it sounded like, why did they say, why are you focusing on inequality yeah. when the nomadic egalitarian model is also uh, saying that why you contrast uh, egalitarian uh, behavior with coercion? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, so prestige based informal hierarchies. Yeah, yeah so uh, two quick points. I do think that some formulations of the nomadic egalitarian model, like it sounds this asker is saying, um, do preclude or exclude status competition. Um, and I think uh, these examples really, some of these examples like the ASMAT where, or, or the Pacific Northwest peoples where they are taking on new names um, and there's very explicit rankings among individuals when they have these pot latches um, really do involve not only minimizing status competition but openly demonstrating it and publicizing it and institutionalizing it. Um, the reason that it was maybe stressed less in the talk is not because I think um, status competition is not important. Uh, it's more just, I only covered a certain, certain some topics. I also think that many people are increasingly really appreciating the role of informal status hierarchies, even people who otherwise subscribe to the nomadic egalitarian model. Um, but yeah, the I don't want to cite research incorrectly, but it seems like there's also been cool work on thinking about the relationship between status and reproductive success, which suggests that uh, informal status hierarchies exist in those societies that we often consider nomadic egalitarian. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Monvir. Yeah, let, let me ask you a couple of questions uh, from the audience, and then I'll ask our panelists uh, if we have any, anything. Uh, the next question is, a tenet of the early 20th century social, so, sociologist was, was where the family, that is a group that cooperates and raise and very young, was the main social institution in pre-modern cultures. They saw pre-modern societies as alliances between families, but being allied didn't stop families competing for resources and reproductive success. Would you say that a complex society is an alliance between a large number of families with perhaps some groups 
uh, taken on the role of ruling families. Um, so when I think about an example like the like the Haida, I, again, I don't want to mischaracterize ethnographies, but I think about it as you having corporate lineages. Um, so you have like this clan uh, that has a mythical ancestor and you have competition among lineages. You also have alliances among lineages, but then you have uh, a hierarchy or ranking of lineages. So at least when I think about that one example, I think about not necessarily an alliance of, not like a set of lineages that co-rule, but a ranking of a series of lineages. When I think about a group like, again, other people on the call probably know better, but when I think about something like the Calusa, I don't know how the Calusa work, but the way that it's described is you have a king and you have a nobility and you have them ruling over um, these villages. And at least in the archeology span and the ethnography, there is much less discussion of, um, of corporate lineages. I, I don't know what it is. Maybe it was an alliance of, of families, um, but it's striking that it, like the Calusa, at least as it's described, seems to have really departed in some ways from, from a kin-based corporate structure or a kin-based structure because they also talk about a priestly class, uh, a military class, um, yeah. So to answer the question, yeah, I don't think it's always necessary a, necessarily a series of alliances among among families. I, that seems plausible, at least for one example. It seems to be a ranking for another example, like the Calusa. It seems to potentially be less kin-based, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Um, the next one. I, I couldn't disagree. This is an interesting question. I, I couldn't disagree with the critique of the stereotypical view of hunter gatherers uh, of nomadic egalitarian model. And you've presented a very interesting collection of counter ex examples. But this is a view that is centuries old in cultural and social anthropology. Maybe the question is why that model has survived this long in evolutionary anthropology. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I agree that, well, I guess there are two questions. One is how far back do, do can we make these in inferences? So if you look at like 1985, you see, I forget the name of the book, but you see this groundbreaking book that's documenting complex hunter-gatherers throughout history um, or throughout the Holocene and it's archeological evidence, um, Brown, I think, and someone, but 1985. You look at passages in that book and even then they're, they're very cautious and some people are explicitly still saying that what they're calling complex hunter-gatherers did not live into the Pleistocene, um, or at least did not live before 20 or 30,000 or 35,000 years ago, uh, among those who are maybe a little, a, a bit like pushing on it more, people who are maybe working on the Russian plains. Um, so I guess I would have two responses. One, I definitely agree with the sentiment that um, hunter-gatherers or many researchers for quite a while have appreciated that foragers are capable of building societies beyond the nomadic egalitarian model. The extent to which archeologists and even sociocultural anthropologists think that we can back infer this kind of social structure to a hundred thousand years ago. I'm actually not familiar with people who have been willing to make that argument. And that's partly because of things like, I like I was saying, I think a major one is, is that for much of the 20th century, people thought aquatic resource exploitation was relatively recent. Still, why has it continued to survive in evolutionary anthropology? Um, and I think that is an interesting question. To be fair, it's like people like Marion have only been doing their very cool stuff. I, as far as I know, Marion's like syntheses have come out in the last like 10, 15 years. Um, we think about McBrearty and Brooks, that was 2000. So that's really shifting thinking about um, behavioral modernity as something that happened 40, 50, 60, 70,000 years ago to something 200,000 years ago. Um, so I do think it makes sense that evolutionary anthropologists would be cautious and wouldn't until recently make this kind of an argument. 
I think there are other reasons, maybe sociological, that evolutionary anthropologists subscribe to a nomadic egalitarian model. I'm not going to go into them now, but but I think there are maybe field specific socio like sociological reasons. Uh, let me ask one more question uh, from the audience, and then I'll uh, ask uh, panelists. Uh, in societies with, with uh, exclusive social units such as tribes, it's pretty clear from genetics usually on how they, uh, on how they are much more inbred and divergent between each and our, as seen from Dagestan to Papua New, Gu New Guinea. Uh, but in Paleolithic Europe and Australia, we see an incredible uniformity in genetics to skull morphology. Uh, obviously, uh, we might one day see more uh, inbred skulls from Paleolithic one day, but your idea of exclusive social unions in general does not have much evidence of it before the Holocene, I guess, from morphology and genetics. Saying that like the genetics and morphology would indicate much more fluid uh, uniform. gene flow. Yeah. So I, I mean, I don't think that what I have argued would ha has the implication of there being um, endogamy of certain kinds of units. Uh, yeah, I mean, if we think about corporate lineages, corporate lineages are often people are, you know, you build alliances across corporate lineages. Yeah, you might have endogamy on the on the unit of the ethnolinguistic group, but I think that assumption, it's unclear to me that that is an assumption that is not made. Like, it, uh, I don't think of that as an implication, as something that like people who would argue for the nomadic egalitarian model would also question or also declare. So, which is all to say, I, yeah, I don't really get how restricted gene flow is an implication of one model, but not the other. But maybe we can talk afterwards. Okay. Uh, now, let me ask our panelists uh, if, yeah, Pete? Yeah, uh, uh, man, really, uh, very nice talk. Uh, it seems to me that the there are uh, a couple of three puzzles that at least pu uh, things that at least puzzle me. The first is, as you show in the in the slide that's still up here on on the screen, th those uh, uh, adaptations uh, that uh, Curtis Marion and others have excavated in South Africa are all during the last interglacial. And the last interglacial, like the present interglacial, like the Holocene, uh, climates were were quite stable for substantial periods of time. It seems from the from the uh, paleoclimatology, and so you might have expected that uh, the last interglacial would have looked a lot like the Holocene. But uh, and and maybe these uh, coastal adaptations uh, uh, point to something in that direction. But uh, overall. Uh, nothing much happened in the last interglacial, and a whole lot happened in in the present interglacial. That's a puzzle to me. And then the the last glacial was extremely uh, the climate was extremely variable, and yet uh, and population density seemed to have been very low. And yet uh, uh, we have this puzzle that, that uh, uh, archaeological industries like the Gravettians seem to be culturally fairly similar over huge areas, as if uh, the uh, Gravettian people were all in pretty intimate contact with one another. That, that doesn't look at anything like the Holocene uh, in terms of hunter-gatherers that are uh, culturally uniform on a, on a continental scale is, uh, is, is a big puzzle to me. It, it, it seems as if the Pleistocene people were at very low densities, but were Pretty highly organized, uh, uh, partly along the lines of your theme, but uh, but they uh, but this was the most unpredictable environment, uh, uh, perhaps the most unpredictable environment in the whole Pleistocene was in the last uh, last ice age. So uh, it seems to me we got to think completely outside the Holocene box to to uh, solve these puzzles. But uh, they, they, I don't know what the solution is. I just uh, lay that out for your, uh, to get your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, those are admittedly 
If uh, my answers would only be speculations, those are important puzzles. Um, I mean, uh, and maybe you disagree, but uh, it seems like we just rather than there not have like there wasn't much during the last interglacial or the last um, yeah during the last interglacial. It seems like we just don't know what was happening, right? Well, if if it had uh, been uh, like the present, right. if it had been like this one, then uh, we're, we're leaving a ton of junk for archaeologists to dig up, tons and tons, uh, billions of tons, I suppose, uh, trillions of tons. So, uh, if the if the last interglacial had looked like the Holocene, we'd know it for sure. It seems to me, uh, and it was. Uh, but uh, comparatively speaking, uh, as I say, it doesn't look like much happened. Uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 well, so that's a puzzle to me. Why? Why doesn't the last interglacial look like the present interglacial? No, I agree. I agree. I mean, yeah, I agree that the last interglacial did not look like the Holocene, and that is puzzling. Um, I mean, working on this project has really, and so much work comes back to this, but it, it often comes back to like, what is the theory of the Holocene? Um, Yeah, I, I agree that that's a puzzle and I don't know. I would say, and again, this is just being cheap, but, um, or possibly it's it's just underscoring this, but we still, I think there's a lot of opportunity for archeology span to continue to change how we understand the last interglacial. Um, but I agree it wasn't on the scale and who knows, who knows, yeah. Your second question was, Oh, why was there so much uniformity in Upper Paleolithic Europe and not uh, if, if it were like the Holocene, we would expect much more diversity? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it seemed to me that that the archaeology shows that uh, uh, stylistic variation uh, in the Holocene is on the is on a uh, uh, a subcontinental scale. It's pretty small scale uh, stuff. We, you, you know, you talked about the ethnolinguistic units being on the order of a, of a thousand people or so, uh, whereas uh, <clears throat> there may have been something like 40,000 Upper Paleolithic people in, in what we call Europe from the Urals to the Atlantic. And, and uh, uh, but <clears throat> they, uh, at least during the Gravedian and Aurignacian periods, they seem to have been culturally quite similar across the whole like the original EU or something that there, um, uh, there, there's this stylistic uniformity on a on a quite uh, a large scale, which is uh, how do we fit that into our uh, picture? I don't think there's <clears throat> anything comparable in the in the Holocene that we can point to until until uh, globalization, modern globalization that that could resemble the uh, Upper Paleolithic and in, in Europe, at least. Right, right. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, our point is, and uh, you might be making these claims regardless, but our point is not that um, the Upper Paleolithic or the last interglacial were equivalent to the Holocene. It's just that they maybe our impulse to say that they were mobile and small scale and egalitarian is misplaced and there was much more social diversity. Towards your question, yeah, I don't know, that is puzzling. Um, something that I have also found puzzling in that vein is Sungir, which until they did the genetics, people would have assumed on the basis of our analogies that this is um, sedentary, potentially large, large group size, um, because you were seeing apparently so much wealth. And then according to David Reich's analyses, it's incredibly inbred and on the group size of like some of the Ongi or some Andaman Islanders. Um, and it might just come back to a larger point that is making inferences about the Pleistocene on the basis of Holocene analogs is less useful than, than we think. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the findings from Sungir in the, really kind of highlighted something puzzling.
in, in that same vein. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, one there. Uh, Tom, if you have a question, just show yourself. Um, uh, I, I, I see there is a lot of comments in the chat, and I'm not sure if these are just some discussions people have or the questions for Manvir. So if you have questions for Manvir, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, yeah, and Eric, uh, there is a lot of these discussions here in the chat, and it would be good uh, to save it the same way as uh, you save Q&A and put them on the web page later. Uh, okay, and there is another question here. Um, there is this notion of richness uh, that uh, you mentioned. How long can population dynamics and immigration keep some groups richer than ours? So like subgroups within a larger population? Uh, I, I guess there can be some turnover of groups coming and taking over the resources. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, in talking to Richard Rangham about about this and in talking to him even before we started working on this, he suspects that places of places with the kinds of that would support low mobility, larger group size would act as um, source populations in a source sync dynamic that you would have maybe intense competition over here, you have much more dense living, you have more hierarchy, that potentially is shooting out people who are, who are invading these other areas. Um, but to, for the question of how long, for instance, a, a lineage would, would rule, I'm not sure. I feel like Sergey probably knows those kinds of questions better. Oh, well, <laughs> it, it depends on the assumptions, of course. Right. Okay, yeah, let me ask you one last question. Um, Certain locations of a very productive land within a very hostile, bigger land, like the Nile Valley. Wouldn't we expect these kind of places to be where large, non-mobile, non-egalitarian societies would most likely to be? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I definitely think that the Nile Valley. I mean, the Nile Valley, you have the, the early Khartoum soon after the Holocene begins. Um, you have fish salting. You eventually have... Uh, the, you know, you have complex society and really impressively um, in talking to archaeologists, what I was told, so uh, this is a natural question, maybe we should look at the Nile in the late Pleistocene for indications. Um, I've been told that the Nile has a very unreliable arche archaeological record because it has this tendency to swing, presumably, that um, with changing sea levels and with just shifts in flow, it's moving around. And this is at least what Christian Tryon told me about its archaeological record. But again, during the Holocene, you see very quickly the early cartoon. OK, great. Yeah, we have uh, some more questions, but I think we should stop now and let uh, Manvir relax a little bit. Uh, thank you very much, Manvir, for the great talk and very stimulating talk. And there is a lot of interesting discussion in Q&As and in the chat that we'll uh, save, so everybody will be able uh, to see them. And thank you, everybody, for your participation. And we hope to see you next week when Tom Curry will be talking about the evolution of social institutions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again for having me. This was a lot of fun.